Okay, my friends, this is a trip down memory lane. I'm going to go back to when I first started and was really, really getting pushy into academia to make them say, I, they, they have to look at these mud fossils. And they still refuse, and they still refuse to this very day. Now, this is the D uh, DNA in CAT scans, and this goes back to 2015, July of 2015. I'm shopping this around the world to everyone, and I'm going to Johns Hopkins University. I took a course there and to, to one of the top guys in genetics, and um, that didn't work out well. I went to, of course, I went to Harvard and Yale and all the rest of them, and none of them would speak to me. So here's what we have. This is the CAT scans, and you can't see much in mud fossils as far as CAT scans go. The best place is to see the surface features using CAT scans. These were done by Jesse Garant and Associates. They are basically the top people in the world doing CAT scans. They do them for like Rolls Royce and all these big, big places. Now, you see this right here? You see that right there? Do you see the similarity? Those are tendons that run up, this is the bone emplacement, right here, that was the bone, I broke this piece off, just because you can see inside, it's not the same as the outside, the outside is where the skin and the membranes of the, the tissue layer was, inside you have basalts and so forth, so that's where they get all confused, they just don't understand that these are body parts, now that is the bone, you see that, this is a thumb, your thumbs are offset, your other fingers have the bone right in the center. So this is a thumb, and it is the left thumb. And I have the hand, and, uh, and I'll show you that in a second. And then I have this. This is very, very cool. This here is the back of a finger, all right? So this here is basically this right here. Then you have tendons that run down to the side so your finger can go back and forth. That's these tendons right here. <laughs> and you see the little nub in the center there? That's where the center of the tendon core of it turns into muscle. And that's what pulls this finger back and forth. That's literally the muscles that were on this bone ball, which was your knuckle. That's that knuckle right there. And there's the bone ball. And there's the bone ball deteriorated. It came out of the ground just like this. It was like almost a <laughs> you couldn't get this better if, if you tried. This shows the, the layers of tissue that surrounded the bone, and the bone actually ran back this direction. It's, it's the, one of these bone, bones that goes up your finger, and then that bone ball at the end goes out. And this is the tendon that pulls it back and forth. And there would have been one on this side, too. If it was, if it was a middleish finger, if it was in this, this area, you're going to have one on each side. Out here, you're just going to have one. Maybe this was a, a f out ed edge of the finger. In, the, in that case, it would have been a right hand finger, because the left hand one would have hit, hit, run this way. I believe, or uh, yeah, because they do run down this way. There's no question about that. So this would have had to been a right hand finger if this was just not even there. If it was a middle finger, it would have just been eroded off. And I believe, I don't know, it's hard to tell. Very hard to tell. I can't see any evidence of a tendon being here. And I see tendons coming right out of there. So you would normally expect it to be coming right out of here. And I do not see that. Every time I pick one of these up, I could find something new to look at. There is so much to investigate here. And I was told by all the top people in the world, you can't get DNA from, from rocks. Now, they, Mary Schweitzer got it out of a T-Rex cell, a T-Rex bone. And then, then, then this is what I was told by Harvard and Yale and uh, Johns Hopkins, all of them. You can't get any DNA out of rocks. Well, let me tell you something. I got more blood coming out of rocks than they do out of bones, guaranteed. And I will be showing you lungs and blood and everything else very shortly. So that's this fingertip. Now, can we see bones in here? Actually, not very well. All right, here's what happened. 
I discovered on my property, I mean scads of mud fossils, and I could tell they were body parts. And then I started to investigate, why would you find just a lung laying there? Why, why would that? And why does this one not have the pleura on it anymore? This has the coating. This is actually this lung here. And this was um, DNA tested and CAT scanned and everything else. And it, it, these were the product of a flood. And I believe now, it may have been actually a hot water flood because we were almost impacted by Venus, according to Velikovsky, who is my hero, and I wrote a book about him because I was so upset about how they treated him. And you look it up, Velikovsky affair, absolute disgrace. Now, so I discover all these things, and they're flat as a pancake on one side. I said, why is this? Why is that lung absolutely flawless on this side and flat as a pancake there? And why do some of them have all of this fabric on them, but when you break inside of them, they're the basalts, just like this goose. That's a goose. And that goose's feathers are right there. That's the pattern of his feathers. And why is this goose coated with felspar? Same thing this is. Because felspar is collagens, and the collagens are stabilized by aluminum silicates. The aluminum is the key. It goes both ways, and it is extremely reactive. And, um, and it found a way to bind these transition metals and so forth inside the fleshy areas, which you see this is a basalt now. That's not, that's not felspar like this. Now, if you know, you can look at it, maybe you can see it in the light. You have to focus. On, but that's his neck right there. And... And the blood vessel is right up there. And I drilled into that just to look and see. That's where the artery was. And there's the feather patterns. All right, this is not, this is not a joke. This is for, for real. This is true. And you see this? The side is flat. It was in a flood. And it was in a salt water flood. And again, I believe it was in a hot water, salt water flood. And here's a bone. Same thing, all coated with that fascia. Uh, well, on a bone, you know, I think they call it periosteum. The ancients called it tunica, but it's a wrapping of the bone. You see those little holes right there? That's where the, the nerves and blood vessels go out through. Now, there's one little spot left on this bone. There is still bone right there. I don't even know if you can see that. It's so small. That little tiny white spot is the last bit of bone. And this is what they always look for. And this is why I ran into trouble. And I can understand that. I understand that because everyone I'm told me, you're crazy. There's no way you can get blood out of rocks. I mean, that's just a saying. But it's not true. Look at this one. There's another lung right there. And I, I had anatomists look at this. And they, this, I mean, you can't miss this. You see all these little keyhole spots? You see those little holes? You see all these ones here? Same thing over here. They're all over the whole thing. But some of them have little red bloods. Well, blood. I know it's blood because it ran over on my counter. And it apparently was laying down this way in the mud, and this was sticking up, and all that blood drained down, and it got stuck. When you're in the mud, it encapsulates it just like it was in a body. Ba basically, blood is nothing more than fleshy tissue that has eroded. I'm, I'm just telling you the facts. And that's what this was in. And when it came out of this wet red clay mud, it was just continuously wet here. You see, that's the same as it. See these holes? Same as these, the uh, alveoli. Now, this is what ran out of that lung. When I say ran out, they bubbled up. Not every one of them was bubbled up as good as some of these. This goes a long time ago. This was done. This was right when they first came out of the ground. That's why this was so red and bloody looking. I, th I think I drilled right in there. All you need is a little pin drill. And you drill down into where you find a nice red bloody spot. And you pull all the blood out. And, um, well, you know, you pull all the blood out, you take out particles. But this is, um, I, I could show all this stuff in the microscope. I've shown it hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times now. I have thousands of videos, literally, on this. And I've been up against this wall since day one. So this is the documentary. Otherwise, because if I die, nobody's going to know how this started. Nobody's going to know the first interactions. I have nothing really that well documented on this, but I'm going to do it today. And it's going to start with Mary Schweitzer. Here we go. 
All right, this is back in 2015. I had three DNA tests done. I extracted the DNA from three different samples. One of them was a giant human hand that I had the fingers and the knuckles and the palm and all that for. The other one was this lung that is a, also another human lung. And then another one was from a giant that was even much, much bigger than this. And this is the tip of a thumb. That's the bone. I'm going to show you the CAT scan. This is the DNA test. This was done in um, 2015, summer of 2015. Now it goes through down. You could read. I have this. I'll, I'll link to this online. And I extracted it. Not the not the people that did the test. I extracted the samples. Sent it to them. Very well done no problems I don't want to discuss all the little details I know how to do it it was very well done and it, it was dense it was dense and it was uh, an excellent quality somewhere in here says it successfully done or something yeah excellent quality DNA sequences obtained from the 36 inch tip in the lung and uh, there they are homo sapien mitochondria homo sapien d loop and th th it's a certified lab and a certified lab director told me that they stand behind the test as long as you understand that i was the one that extracted the stuff whatever we sent them was what is the samples and this is what the and the sequencing and analysis and all that says now let me show you the third thing. Remember, this is a lung about the size of us. This is a fingertip from, I think the guy had to be about maybe 50 feet tall, something like that. And let me show you the big boy. I'm sure at some point I have or will show you the fingertip. Uh, well, I show you the fingertip and the cat skin and so forth. But that's the hand that goes with it. This is the grip skin that's peeling off of this hand because that's the tough spot. This is a left human hand, and it's been DNA tested. I have the knuckles and so forth. Now, this is the um, this is the giant fingertip. This baby's huge. It's like 30 inches long, front to back. This is the fingernail. All right. This little pad is the bumper pad that bumps up against your next bone, so they can rock on there. See the bump, the fingernail. This I broke off here to get down to where I get some DNA out of it. And it has a fingerprint on it, just like you would have. Uh, you see it, the fingerprint? This is right here, and that's the grip skin. You see the size? My thumb is the same size as one of these fingerprint ridges. And this is the thumb that it came off. And I have more parts from this one too. There's another finger laying very close, a little more eroded, but not too bad. And this one here is, that's it right there. That's what grip skin is. You see this? Very, very tough, keratinized. That means it's gritty and gnarly and tough. And that's your, the surface of your grip skin. The fine skin on your face and so forth, totally different. These are the sweat pores, and these are the fingerprint ridges. It's in pretty good shape. And I went and got the DNA out from inside, and the fingers are flush with DNA, uh, blood. And I know where to get it. There's arteries all over the place. Very simple to do when you know what you're doing, and I know what I'm doing. Now, hold on one second. Now here's the problem with mud fossils and and cat scan and cat scans. You can see the blood vessels. That they're very easy to see because there, there's holes there. there. There's a completely different texture to them and everything else. However, outside of the blood vessels, which are not really invadable, the rest of the tissue becomes nucleophilically replaced. So what you can see, if you look carefully. You have to look really careful. Well, maybe not real careful, but 
You have to look careful or not. That is the bone. That's the actual core of the bone, the center of the bone right there. Whether or not you can see that, I do not know. However, that is what happens in nucleophilic substitution. It's, or it's also called nucleophilic invasion. And it, it, that's what exactly what it is. There's, there's, there's electrophiles and neutrophiles. There's entering groups and leaving groups. And here's what happens in salty, wet flood conditions where these are coated in mud and so forth. The waters work their way through the tissues because that's just the nature of tissues. They like to, they're fluidy. Now, as those waters work their way through, these transition metals primarily, which are the things that transfer molecules all the time in your body, all the time, back and forth, you're never stable. Not one single molecule in your body is stable, basically. Maybe your teeth, some of your enamel, but that's about it. Everything else has to be continuously supported with more and more nutrients, take out the garbage, bring in the good stuff. So. Once they die, and in this condition, you, the waters are still flowing through there. Well, the biologically degradable stuff in there says, hey, if I can find somebody that has the correct number of molecules that I can attach to, this flesh can become stone. And that's exactly what happens. As I just showed you, bones, fingertips, tendons, the pads underneath the finger, lungs, every single thing there is can become a stone in this condition. It's called nucleophilic substitution. I have fully, fully worked on this, totally understand it. I've made my own mud fossils. That's a goose, and those are feathers. Whoops. Sorry about that. I was a little too unmagnified. Now, I don't know where I lost you, but uh, I better go back and look. But anyway, this is a goose, and that's his feathers on the top. And that's basalt inside, and that is feldspar on the outside. Every feldspar is aluminum silicates, and aluminum is the binder. <laughs> that's the binder for the collagens. Okay, my friends, this is going to be my documentary on my research starting from when I first discovered what I discovered and I named eventually mud fossils. I started out by seeing something on TV 60 Minutes showed Mary Schweitzer had discovered T-Rex DNA in bones. Well I had stones that had literally blood coming on them so I tried to contact her. Now, then it all started to unravel as I needed to have my information shown and I was having a hard time getting it out, let's put it that way. And I can fully understand that. Now I fully understand why and I need to express myself and, and, and apologize to some people and chastise others. <laughs> Boy, I'll tell you, it just doesn't get stranger than this. I interacted with Mary Schweitzer just very, very briefly, and it wasn't really cordial. Let's just go with that. But she had the wherewithal to stand up and say, I want this looked at. I have found, you know, biological signatures in these bones. And, of course, they really hammered her, and, and they really caused her a lot of distress. And one of the people she worked with, I believe, sued and uh, uh, because he was dismissed. I can't remember. So there was a legal thing going on there. But anyway, she, I didn't know a lot about her, because I went into look to, to say, uh, you know, here's Mary Schweitzer and she discovered uh, T-Rex DNA and, and that's it and I was going to go on from there. Well, the story gets very, very strange because she is a creationist. Well, she was. This is a very, very amazing story now. She was a young earth creationist and she her family and her church and all this when she started doing this biological stuff and started learning about evolution and now she buys into evolution it sounds like and she's dropped the young creationist stuff
And here I am with giants and talking about the earth being biological and all this. She flapped one way, I flapped the other way. I'm telling you, this is just incredible. And I have the evidence to support what I'm saying. Now, and she lost everything. She's, you know, you start reading the story about her, what happened to her when she found this. Her husband told her what she was doing, it was irrelevant, apparently. Well, I'm not going to say what he said, but she said that that her broke her heart when he told her that her work was irrelevant. And the other thing was when she was accepted by academia for having one of these cells, and he, Jack Horner, told her, prove to me that, that I'm wrong. Because Jack Horner was saying, I'm an atheist, and, da, da, da. and she's saying, I'm a creationist. Well, he turned her around, basically, to turn her into an evolutionist. It sounds to me. Okay, now here she is. This is paleontology news. I don't care what they say about me. And that's Mary Schweitzer. Because they were really after her. And here she is next to her T-Rex. And she had found the DNA, as I'm sure I mentioned before. Now, um, hold on a second. All right, listen to this now. See if I'm getting this wrong. I might be. She's saying that she, the guy that they did Jurassic Park modeled around was this guy, Jack Horner. So she called him up. She says, hi, Jack. I'm Mary. Schweitzer recalls telling him, I'm a young Earth creationist. I'm going to show you you are wrong about evolution. So here's Mary saying, you're wrong, Jack. Jack says, hi, Mary. I'm Jack. I'm an atheist. <laughs> Then he agreed to let her sit in on his courses. So she went for six months. Horner opened Schweitzer's eyes to the overwhelming evidence supporting evolution and Earth's antiquity. So he opened her eyes. He didn't try to convince me, she says. He just laid out the evidence. Well, she rejected many fundalist, fundamentalist views, a painful conversion. So she dropped the young Earth God thing. It cost me a lot, my friends, my church, my husband, but it didn't destroy my faith. She felt that she saw God's handiwork in setting evolution in motion. It made God bigger, she says. That's a fine, that's fine. Uh, you know, and I, trust me, I almost lost it. Well, I did lose basically everything. Um, I'm still married. <laughs> now, anyway, this started to really changed my line of thinking because I was pushed away and I thought it was because I was bringing giants and that's the first thing they said to me oh what are you one of these creationists now it's starting to make sense to me because she was a creationist and now it's really starting to play because I was right in the same time frame as her Right in 2010, 2011, 2012 I was you know in Harvard and Yale and all that and that's what they just hammered me with that God stuff, like it was everything was about God, and I said, no, it's just, it's just, it's, it, these are mud fossils. That's a mud fossil. These are DNA tests. These are everything. This is true. No, 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 no. And that was it. Now it's starting to make sense. Now this is going to take some time to go through this, and I'm going to do it chapter by chapter. I probably put it on a playlist or something, and um, and because trust me, this unfolded over a well, the last. 10 years at least and you know that I'm a pretty busy guy so there was a lot of interactions with a lot of different people and they they all failed the test as far as I'm concerned as being scientists so stay with me we're gonna go part one part two part three and I guess the way in mathematics works you just keep going up the line until you hit infinity okay I'll see you at infinity